If you are a gamer who doesn't quite feel old enough already, the original Crisis will helm its one decade anniversary this November. Crisis was a big deal when it was first released, and held the title of the go-to benchmark tool for new hardware for many years to follow. It was also the game that made me foolishly purchase a Radeon 2900 XT for an extortionate amount of money, which could barely run solitaire without having a near meltdown. Not long after purchasing Crisis, said 2900 XT somewhat blew up, and for half the price I procured a Zotac 8800 GT, and balance was once again restored. Crisis follows the naming convention of its pseudo predecessor, Far Cry, incorporating the engine upon which it's built into its title. Far Cry is quite a commonplace title these days, having made numerous sequels and spin offs across most all platforms since the days of the original Xbox, and even bizarrely landing itself an arcade release. The original Far Cry set the foundation as to what would be expected from games with the Cry affixation. In being an open world first person shooter where you play as a one man army in what was at the time an enormous leap in graphics and open world level design. I haven't revisited the original Far Cry for quite some time and I have to say I didn't expect it to look quite as good as it still does. Anyway, a mere three years later Crytek would release its next big evolutionary leap in the form of Crisis. Crisis takes place seven days after a distress message is received from a small research team on Lingshan Island. Korean forces have invaded, taking the island by force, and it is up to Raptor team to come in and put a stop to their meddling ways. You take control of Nomad, who, along with his team, are outfitted with futuristic nanosuits. You parachute onto the island under the cover of darkness, and from here the game lets you proceed at your own pace, with only mission markers to guide your next location. Upon your descent, however, something interrupts your suit's power and you plummet into the shore, separating you from your teammates. My suit's gone! My damn suit is gone! This is sort of a non-expositional way of pointing towards your suit's abilities right off the bat, as they come back online. And from here, every ability is available to you without the unnecessary need to unlock things as you go on. There is a very brief tutorial which is standard for an FPS, and this comprises of crouching under something, jumping over something, and shooting someone in the face, and that's pretty much all you need to know. Traversing past your first minor encounter will bear witness to the sun rising over the ocean, lighting up the open world sandbox that we have to play around in, though open world is a statement that has to be taken with a pinch of salt really. The early portions of the game will have you trying to get from point A to point B, experimenting with different methods of attack to the enemy outposts that you will invariably encounter. Donning a power suit is nothing that is new to games, but the unique selling point of the Crisis Nano Suit is the ability to turn invisible, and this is visually achieved by the pleasing water reminiscent light distortion that was made popular from the Predator movies. To accompany this stealth mechanic, we also have on-the-fly weapon customization. Most every gun in the game can be affixed with a silencer and variation of scopes, allowing for fast-paced close-quarters combat or long-range sniper battles. There is also a large emphasis on physics-based destructive environments. Almost every non-brick structure or item can be destroyed, pulled apart or thrown to create a makeshift weapon, or you can just blow it up to see how well it will fly around. It is something that is always fun to see in games. The first hour or so of the game will have you testing the water with what is the best approach for dispatching our Korean invaders, and whatever method you choose, each of the suit's abilities will invariably come into play. It would be remiss of you, however, to not stand like an invisible lamppost whilst a car full of bad guys drives past to reveal the explosive tank on the back. Stealth is not always the best option though. Even with the best of intentions, enemies will at some point see you when you come back into sight, and the inability to fire whilst cloaked makes this an occurrence that will happen often. To get you out of your scrapes, you also have speed, strength and armour modes, and all of these pull from the same power source. Along with your regenerating health, you also have a power meter, and this drains and recharges at a fairly quick rate, which I believe varies depending on which difficulty setting you are playing on. I was playing through on hard mode, which meant it drained in about 2 seconds in most instances. Speed allows you to walk at a sprinting pace, and allows for a quick dash to get you out of harm's way or clear a long jump. Armour is self-explanatory, soaking up bullets and damage, and is a must in the middle of a firefight. And finally strength, which lets you punch harder, throw things further, and steady your aim. You will probably adopt a three-step method of using speed to get to your next location, stealth to infiltrate, and then armour as soon as it all goes wrong. 
Suit mechanics aside, this is a first person shooter at heart and your enjoyment will derive from how well the game delivers on that front and for the most part, this is pulled off perfectly well. Weapons and enemies for the most of the game adopt a realistic approach. You will always have a pistol as a trusty sidearm which can be dual wielded should you find another and you will acquire a small arsenal of assault rifles along with the other staples of the FPS genre in form of a shotgun, sniper rifle, grenades and rocket launcher. You can only carry two main weapons at any one time so you have to be considerate with what you want to outfit yourself with. The Korean inhabitants of the island roam around in small squads or occupy bases in small groups and their behaviour ranges from intelligent to idiotic. Squads of enemies will try to flank you if they know your location and they will lay down suppressing fire and try to flush you out with grenades. This can make for some quite exciting gameplay. Getting cornered in a small shack whilst trying to find a clear path short enough to invisibly walk there before your energy runs out to find a new hiding spot can be an enjoyable experience. However the AI is affected with a few inconsistencies. Enemies have a tendency to forget what they are doing and just wander off, or just plain not notice you when you stand in front of them. If you really want to break their thought process, save and load your game in the middle of a battle. It can act as sort of a men in black style memory eraser. These are small instances however, and they don't ever really make the gameplay less or more challenging. As you progress, you will meet up with what is left of the rest of your squad, and the plot will slowly unfurl. The research team that initiated the distress call excavated an ancient statue which has sparked the interest of the Korean military. Once your presence has been well and truly established, the invading forces go on the offensive, introducing tanks and helicopters as a new form of obstacle to overcome. I never shot down one helicopter that wasn't satisfying to watch explode, and luckily these are a regular occurrence. The one thing I haven't mentioned up until this point is how the game looks, and this is a question that I have re-asked myself as the years have gone on. Back upon first release, this looked spellbinding, but due to how physically demanding the game was, experiencing it completely maxed out would lead to rather slow times. With each new graphics card would come new higher settings allowing for a slightly new graphical enhancement, however even the most ambitious game made 10 years ago really won't be a chore for modern gaming hardware. So to be able to play it again with everything it has to offer on display, it is comforting to say that it still doesn't fail to impress. It is almost unnecessarily vast for what is at its core a rather linear first person shooter and this can benefit the game favourably or be to its detriment. Times when crisis is at its most impressive is when you are surrounded by foliage in what feels like a living jungle or forest. Small details like shallow rivers in your path help to make your presence in this world feel coincidental like time is moving on not dictated by the fact that you are in it and this helps to immerse you in the experience. What unfortunately has the opposite effect is when the level design becomes uninspired. There is in particular a tank battle which takes place in large open fields. This felt more like an excuse to showcase the tank mechanics rather than something that felt natural to the game. However that is not to say that the game is all semi-realistic military infiltration. Eventually, and spoilers, you will reach the excavation site which the entire game has revolved around. We are quick to learn that the interest sparked by the excavation stems from the potential for the ultimate power source. Inevitably, opening the doors to such power comes with consequences and after one of the very few boss fights in the game, you find yourself trapped with only one way to progress. In many ways, this is the game's turning point. Not only is it the curveball that the plot sorely needed, but the game from here on becomes substantially more interesting and fun. It won't take long to realise that what you have actually walked into is a slowly awakening alien structure complete with zero gravity, flying monsters and a complete shift in art direction. This is a real welcome shift in tone as prior to this we have been almost exclusively fighting our way outside and a new type of enemy and close quarters corridors offers up a well needed bit of variety. That is not to say that this section is completely linear however, I did get stuck once or twice on which path to float down but you can't moan at extraterrestrial layouts to be counterintuitive. Eventually, you'll make your escape and be blasted out into the unexpected change in setting. It seems the awoken alien species like things cold and their megastructure has been utilised as a terraforming tool, creating an arctic winter. The first time playing this I found it to be genuinely unexpected. The game up to this point is generally slow paced and that really helps to aid the urgency in your escape. From here on the game is a blast to play. And with the exception of a terrible flight section, it doesn't let up until the final encounter. When revisiting a game like this after so many years, there is one big question that will always be there. Is it as good to play now as it was back then? 
And graphically and gameplay wise, Crisis holds up fine, but that is because mostly, that is all the game is. My previous outings to Crisis have always been viewed through the rose tinted glasses of being excited by how well new hardware is performing. However, now that is not a factor, I viewed the game with more of a level design aspect in mind, and that left me feeling slightly unfulfilled. Most of the entire game is compromised of fighting the same few types of soldiers located at outposts along your way. There is very little plot or set pieces that connect these encounters and you could take half of them away and still have the same experience. I think the problem with this is that you never really get any reward for fighting enemies or progressing. One issue of this is the amount of weapons that you acquire. At the start of the game you are outfitted with your scar which is nicely designed and really satisfying to fire. But, all of the Korean soldiers use their own type of assault rifle, so it quickly becomes redundant as you won't find any ammo for it. The FY-71 assault rifle seems to be the weapon of choice as ammo is scattered around for it left, right and centre. But I never found any enjoyment from this weapon, it just feels clunky and a little bit last resort. But with the exception of submachine guns, that's pretty much a lot of standard weapons. You will probably spend 80% of your time with the shotgun and assault rifle as your bread and butter. This dampens the encouragement to encounter enemies or to clear out bases. As you can turn invisible, you can simply walk by for the most of the game and come out on the other end just as well off. That isn't to say that the combat isn't fun, it can be a lot of fun, but it tends to be the same battle over and over again. And the big alien reveal comes way too late in the game to the point where I had become quite bored of fighting Steven Ewan. That's not me being racist, he is the voice actor. The game is touted as having big open maps to explore, and this is indeed true, however because of the lack of definitive direction, it means that set pieces are reliant on enemy placement and AI, which this time round made the game feel a lot more like a tech demo for the engine rather than a solid gaming experience. This is rectified once the aliens make an appearance, which throws at you some more ammo for your scar and the gauze cannon, but this happens so close to the end of the game that you'll be watching the end credits in little over an hour later. There is also a few instances where the game is just a bit broken. First off is the physics. There were numerous times when just walking into a box caused me to be crushed by it. And for whatever reason the game just sucks you into the ground when trying to fly past this part. There was also one section where I actually had to cheat in order to progress. After fighting several invisible guys in one of the more interesting enemy encounters, a dropship is supposed to appear and take you to the next level. However, after running around aimlessly and even retrying the level, this just never happened, so an old school level select was in order. I am always a little bit concerned when reviewing a game from my past, that I know I like it and that nostalgia will take over and I will overlook its shortcomings, but replaying Crisis has put that theory to bed really. It doesn't hold up as well as I had hoped, and at times it felt like a bit of a chore to get through. But then I did have some fun with it, just not enough to perhaps recommend it to someone who had never played it before. I think the main problem with it is that the entire game is a setup for the big reveal, and once you get to that, it ends pretty abruptly. It almost has a two act structure, the first being 90% of the game, and the second being the other 10. I think Crytek realised this, as only a year later they would release Crisis Warhead, which was a constant post-alien invasion shooty fun expansion pack. I still have a lot of admiration for the original Crisis, and without it we would never have had Crisis 2, which is one of my most favourite games of all time. But as the years have gone on, it has slowly diminished from outstandingly impressive to simply average. But that is still an achievement in its own right, and for the first 3 or 4 replays I was perfectly satisfied, which can't be said for a lot of modern titles. Crisis is available on Steam and at goodoldgames.com. However, I did have some issues getting it to work and getting past the secure ROM security, which apparently is down to having a Skylake CPU and or a certain type of motherboard, so buyer beware, you may have to seek out a crack to get it working properly. As always, thank you very much for watching and watch this space for a new review soon.